invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation. And we are entering into um, a new era today. We're entering, we're passing out of a church age and we're entering into an era, a scene in heaven that's opening up a prelude ultimately to the future. It's the only place, the only accurate place, guys, in the entire world that we can go and see the future. Ultimately to see and to gaze into heaven itself. To peer and look upon the Lord of glory, uh, the Lord of heaven, and to see him in his holiness and his greatness. I hope you're as excited as I am today. Revelation chapter 4 would title this an open door to see into heaven and ultimately a tour of heaven uh, that we're going to see. Now back up just for a moment if you would to Revelation 1 just verse 19 before we, before we jump in. Verse 19, let's, let's back up to verse 17, the end of verse 17. The Lord Jesus speaks to John, he says, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now, there's no one but Jesus that can say that, okay? This is him. This is our Lord speaking. Then he says, therefore, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. Write these things that you see, write these things that are, and write these things that will be or that take place after these things. Y'all got that in your, in your heart? This is what Jesus is telling John to write about. Now let's jump to verse 1 of chapter 4, and we're going to begin looking at the open door. Now we're going to walk through this together, uh, look through this um, verse by verse today. Uh, and ultimately, we're going to read the entire chapter of uh, chapter 4 of Revelation. But let me just tell you what I'm going to tell you before I tell you. Y'all ready? So, a door opened into heaven. That's what we're going to start with. A door opened up, a tour that's, uh, that Jesus tells John, hey, come up here. Okay? Then we're going to look at the view of the throne of God. A view of the throne of God. And then we're going to look at worship around the throne of God. Okay, that's, that's where we're going to be today. Now, I, I hope for, as Christians today, we're going to look at this together. It's real, it, it, with, our, with our church family, uh, we're going to go up into heaven and look through uh, the Apostle John's eyes of what he sees and what he declares to us. The throne of God and the worship of God around the throne, the glory around the throne. And this is what we're going to look at today. Now, I cannot do this. I cannot create an awe in you for the throne of God, for the glory of God, for the holiness of God. That is only the work of the Holy Spirit. I cannot do this for you. But guys, listen, if you do not leave here today absolutely in awe of the throne of God, of the holiness of God, the perfection of God, the worship, uh, and, and even the access the awe that we have been given access into the very throne of God. Guys, if, if you do not leave here in, in awe struck, I can't do that for you. Only the Holy Spirit. But my prayer is that you would realize the beauty, the majesty, the sovereignty, the awesome nature of God and his throne. And realize that through Jesus, through this cross, you are given access to the very throne of God. And I pray that you will access his presence today in worship, but also in need. So let's open it up. An open door into heaven. Look at with me in verse 1, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After these things... I want you to take note of that. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard like the sound of a trumpet. Does that sound familiar? Like the sound of a trumpet. The Lord Jesus is speaking, speaking with me, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. After these things. Twice he says, after these things. What does that mean? Now guys, all I can take away from here is what we have looked at are the churches, the seven churches of Revelation. We've gone through it. And honestly, guys, I think uh, every two or three years, we ought to go back and study this. It keeps us sharp. It's been, it's been tough. It's, honestly, it's been hard. There's been a lot of rebuke there. There's been a lot of correction. There's been a lot of understanding about what we're doing right, maybe what we're doing wrong in Jesus' perspective related to the churches. But these churches represent the church age. The church age. And we are still in the church age. We are still present in observing the seven churches of Revelation and looking at crossroads and looking at our family, looking at our church family in relation to the seven churches of Revelation. This is specific instruction and as, as John is writing about the things that are present. While he's on Patmos, there are seven churches and he's writing to these churches, Jesus is speaking to these churches, but these churches represent all the things that we need to know in the church age. And then he says, after these things. I believe this is a step from that which is to that which is going to be. That which is future for Sardis and Philippi and Laodicea, but also for Crossroads. We are about to look into the future after these things. I looked and a door is standing open. As John is writing to us, guys, and, and get this, because Revelation can really be very complex, but ultimately what Jesus is, is doing, he is saying to John, come up here, and much of what John is going to see all the way through Revelation is a vision of what is happening in heaven, okay? When, when, it, when Jesus is saying right now, come up here so that I can show you much of what happens on earth is originating in heaven, okay? The opening up of seals, the trumpets, the bowls, and all of these things is ultimately God's throne, God's directives, God's messengers, God's servants, doing what he says to do. And so a lot of these visions are just us looking into heaven. Now, I'm going to just tell you some of the description of heaven here is very, it can be very, um, uh, sometimes people get scared about it. Sometimes people step back and go, oh man, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand Revelation. I don't know what it's talking about. I don't know. Look, John is going up into heaven Seeing things that God has created, let's just talk about the four creatures, okay? We're going to get to it. The, these four creatures in heaven, these are angels, created beings that John has never seen before, that Ezekiel's never seen before, that Daniel's never seen before, that they're trying to describe these created beings that are around the throne of God, and they do the best that they possibly can to tell us what it looks like. That's all it is. And it should definitely not, as a believer, scare you, but it really should excite you to know that we're going to see this one day fully and completely in heaven. And it is other than anything in this world. I, was, I asked Edward, I said, Edward, I've been you know, trying to think of illustrations that I can use today. There are no illustrations today, human illustrations. Nothing we're going to talk about is human. This is angelic. This is Holy, this is glorious. After these things, I believe this speaks directly after the church age. I'm going to show you what is going to happen after the church age. The church age, guys, closes, closes, a door closes where a church, the church is taken out. Okay? 
Let me tell you why I believe that. I'm going to explain more in a moment. Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Now, wouldn't y'all love to hear that? Wouldn't you love to be John? Wouldn't you have loved to experience this? I don't know about being exiled on an island with a bunch of criminals uh, or persecuted, but I like the whole thought of come up here. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. I will show you what must take place. Is there anywhere else in the whole world that we can receive a glimpse of what is going on in heaven? Guys, there have been a lot of books written of people that say that they have been to heaven and then they come back and they write a book, okay? Guys, a lot of those books... Not only are they silly, but many of those are blasphemous. Many of those books that are written about people's encounters and experiences of leaving this world, going to heaven, coming back, writing a book about it, they are adding to this book. They are describing, let's say, the Holy Spirit is a blue cloud floating through heaven. That's information that we do not have from the Word of God about the Trinity, about the Holy Spirit, guys. And it's given in such a way as though it is fact, that it is true, that this is real, that I've been to heaven and I'm going to come back and tell you about it. Guys, there is only one source, true, infallible, perfect source of gazing into heaven, and that is the Word of God given through his eyewitnesses, his apostles, his prophets, himself. Jesus is taking John on a tour. He says, and I will show you what must take place after these things, a tour of the future. This tells us that God is sovereign over all the events of the future. Guys, with me, we are about to look, we are about to go through together as a church, future events. They have not happened yet in in our time and space on this planet, but they are given to us in great detail. That tells me that Jesus knows exactly what the future events of this world are, what they look like in great detail. All of these bold judgments and all of these things, God is sovereign over these. There's a safe, there's safety in that, isn't there? To know that he, the Lord Jesus, knows exactly what's going to happen in the future. And that he, the Lord Jesus, holds me in his hands. Jesus knows and sees our future, the future of the world and the future of the new heaven, the new earth, in perfect detail. I don't know about you guys, but that gives me great comfort in my life. An open door into heaven. Secondly... A view of the throne of God. Look at verse 2. Revelation chapter 1 verse 2. Immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was standing in heaven. And one sitting on the throne. And he was sitting was like a jasper stone. And a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. I believe this is a very, very important passage of Scripture in directing us. But first of all, he says this. He says, I was in the Spirit. Look there at verse 2. Immediately, I was in the Spirit. Experientially, John was taken up into heaven, though his body was actually still on the island of Patmos. The immaterial part of John, his mind, his will, his emotions, his spirit was translated, taken up into heaven. This is where he means, what he means by in the spirit. He says this back in chapter 1 as well. Then he says, um, and behold... And just in case you need to know, behold means behold. Okay? This means, wow! A throne 
was standing in heaven, the throne of God. Now, this is not the only place in Scripture that we see the throne of God. And so I want us just to look at the description of the throne of God and other uh, sources from the prophets that we have. You can turn to these verses or you can look on the screen. The first is Isaiah. All of us remember Isaiah's encounter with the throne of God. In Isaiah 6, verse 1, it says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filled the temple. Now understand, guys, the throne of God is in a heavenly temple of God. This is not a palace. This is not a place of God's resting place, where a place where God is just resting and doing nothing. This is a temple of God. This is the throne of God in the temple of God uh, surrounded by the glory of God and surrounded by created beings who are worshiping God in heaven in a temple. Seated on a throne, the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim, we're going to get a description of these, are angels stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold uh, trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. Y'all remember what happened to Isaiah after seeing this vision? He was was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed by his own sin. He understood in that moment fully and completely the holiness of God and the sinfulness of his life and also the sinfulness of his people. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah was overwhelmed. And guys, let me tell you, when we look at the throne of God and we look at the holiness of God and we think about ourselves in comparison to that, there's this awesome contrast between God and us, between the holiness of God and the worship of God and the glory of God and us. And then the access that God gives us through Christ into the throne room of God. Look at 1 Kings 22, 19. Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. Micaiah here gives a prophecy of the throne of God and those attending God upon his throne. Ezekiel, awesome prophet of the Lord, gives us a a vision, gives us a description of the throne of God. Look at Ezekiel 1, 25 through 28. And there came a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. This is the seraphim, the angels. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli, in appearance, and on that which resembled a throne high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upward something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance around him. As the appearance of the rainbow In the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. Isn't that incredible how what Ezekiel is saying is so identical, so close to 
what John is saying, if we look back at verse 3, and who was sitting was like jasper. A jasper stone is a clear white stone, almost like a diamond. And a sardius is, an, is a bright red, blood red stone, a sardius in appearance. And I don't know for sure if the sardius here, the stone that John is seeing, is what Ezekiel is seeing in the fire uh, that is like burning, blazing metal. I don't know if that comparison is the same that they're giving there. But then he says, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Ezekiel says that this rainbow surrounding the throne of God was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. Awesome. 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 Isn't it amazing how Scripture interprets Scripture? How we go to one Scripture and we learn some things. Then we go over to Ezekiel and we learn some things. First Kings, we learn some things about the throne of God. Ooh, let's see what Daniel has to say. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, thrones, the court sat, and the books were opened. Sounds like 24 elders and 24 thrones and myriads of attendants, worshipers around the throne. Flames of fire, and the books were opened. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for carrying Daniel along, showing him these things. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading Ezekiel to see these things and leading John to see these things to show us Crossroads Baptist Church in 2021 the throne of God the holiness of God the glory of God the worship of God in heaven Hebrews 12 28 29 the practical look of the presence of God. It says, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, speaking of heaven, is speaking of the glory of God, speaking of glorified being presence of God, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Guys, there's only one response to the throne of God, a, a vision, a tour being led in through the scriptures into the throne of God. There's only one response. It is to serve the Lord, an acceptable service to the Lord of reverence and awe. Serve the Lord. Worship Him in awe and in reverence. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. God on His throne, like a jasper stone, a sardius in appearance, beautiful beautiful throne of God. We can't miss the overall picture of just beauty, majesty, power, perfection, permanence. Amen? This is not a throne that's going to be overtaken or thwarted. This is an established throne forever and ever. 
a rainbow around the throne. Ezekiel tells us there's a rainbow around the throne. John tells us there's a, a rainbow around the throne. But he said it's like an emerald. Well, an emerald is green. An, an emerald is a green stone. Well, it's a green stone, but it's also a, a rainbow. And how does a green stone? I don't know. All I know is that it was green, but it was also a rainbow. And Ezekiel says it was the appearance of the glory of God around the throne. 24 thrones around the throne, 24 elders sitting. There's a lot of discussion about who are the 24 elders. Who are they? Discussion such as that 12 of them are uh, representing the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 of them are the 12 apostles. A lot of discussion such as that these are angelic beings that are seated at thrones before the books are opened. But they're mentioned as 24 elders. It leads me to believe that these are saints, that these are people. It says that they're clothed in white garments, which very, very closely represents throughout Scripture what New Testament saints are clothed in and dressed in and are given upon their entrance into heaven. Many, many references to saints of God clothed in white garments, wearing golden crowns on their head. This is very much a reference to and can be connected with the promise of believers, of, of, of New Testament uh, church member, church representatives that are wearing crowns upon the head, representing the church raptured, okay, all right, here we go, raptured prior to this time and rewarded in heaven, seated, clothed in white garments, wearing golden crowns. And just by the way, guys, this is the last reference to the church in Revelation. This is a picture of these are the things that are going to happen after these things Come up here and let me show you what is going to happen after these things. The church age, the raptured saints of God clothed in white, crowns upon their head, seated around the throne. This is my opinion. We can debate about this. We can sit down in a classroom and talk about it. Oh, I think it's this and oh, I think it's that. And we will have a wonderful time. Amen? Amen. And that's okay. We're not going to get angry with each other and frustrated with each other because, man, I believe it's the 12 tribes and I believe it's the 12 apostles or I believe they're angels. I believe it's the... I just, guys, when you look at it, I just believe that this is, these are the raptured saints seated around the throne, clothed in white, wearing crowns upon their head. We're going to see what else they do here in just a few moments that I believe speaks into that. But this is, this is, it's fun to talk about these things. And it's not something that we get upset with each other about. But nonetheless, let's not miss the picture here of the worship around the throne that we're going to get to in just a moment. And let's not miss our application of this. A temple, a throne room, a throne presence of the Lord. I'm going to read a scripture, guys, that helps us understand how we respond to this now. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, has passed through the heavens. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Then verse 16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Church, listen, when we pray, we are coming into the throne of God. We are approaching I would dare say that many of you have prayed maybe your whole life and you've prayed and you've never thought of the idea that when we pray, we are being translated. Our prayer is coming into the throne of God. It's majestic. It's glorious. It's a privilege We have a great high priest that is sympathizing with us, that knows our weaknesses, that is calling us to come and approach the throne of grace with confidence. I don't know of any other greater motivation for a healthy prayer life for a Christian than the realization that really when we're praying, we are entering into the throne room of God. We were sitting around the campfire, me and Pete, we were talking a little bit about people that come to him and ask him to pray for them uh, and say, hey man, I want you to pray for me because you have a, man, you have a, a direct line. So we want you to pray for us. And, and Pete just looks at him and says, man, yeah, that's just dumb. That you would think that. That you would think that I have any greater access than, than any other Christian on the face of the earth. That we are given through Christ, through the cross, through the resurrection of Christ. We are given and opened up for us this pathway into the heavenlies, into the throne of God, the holiness of God, the glory of God. To me, it would tell us, oh God, let me take that and Come into that access as often as I possibly can. Jesus is the great high priest. Through Jesus, the veil into the throne room of God is entirely taken away. Before, it was just for the priests. And that just once a year. But that veil has been rent. It has been ripped away, giving access to those who trust in Christ by faith. Without Jesus, our high priest, we are shut out from the living God in the context of prayer. Listen very carefully, guys, because this, look, we're not going to argue about who the 24 elders are around the throne, okay? But I'll, I'll die on this hill, what I'm about to say. The man who tries to pray without faith in Jesus Christ, insults the Lord God Almighty. Not only are his prayers not entering the throne of heaven, finding mercy and grace, but those prayers without faith in Jesus are offensive to God. They have rejected his son who was slain before the foundation of the world. Insults the entire plan of salvation. Insults the God of our salvation. The throne of God should be approached with faith in Jesus. The throne of God should be approached Spurgeon says this, the throne of God should be approached with enlarged expectations. <laughs> Woo! Enlarged expectations. I am not coming to a pauper's house. I'm not coming into the Oval Office. I'm not coming into the pastor's study. I'm not coming into the life group prayer time. I'm coming into the throne of Almighty God. Enlarge 
our expectations that we are coming into the throne room of a holy, awesome creator, our God, our Savior. Come to him with wimpy prayers, faithless prayers. But come, the Bible says, approach the throne of grace with confidence. We're not, Spurgeon says, we're not coming to the God's, to God's poor house. We're not coming around the back door to receive some, some scraps, even though that's what we deserve, and we don't even deserve that. Amen. We don't even deserve any table scraps. But God has given us access into his presence, into his throne room, into his majestic glory. We're standing in the temple. Here's what Spurgeon says. We're standing in the temple, in the palace on the glittering floor of the great king's own reception room. And thus, we are placed upon a very good ground with the king. In prayer, we stand where angels bow with veiled faces. He says this, should we come there with stunted requests and narrow faith? Or should we come there with enlarged expectations? Faith in Almighty God. This will change our prayer life, won't it? If we realize through whom we come. To whom we are coming. Where we are praying to God. If prayer is coming before the throne of God, it ought always to be conducted with the deepest sincerity and in the spirit that makes everything real. It should come with the, not only deep sincerity, but it should come with reverence and awe. This is our service to God. My house should be called a house of prayer. Have you prayed in here today? Have you submitted requests to God? Have you brought needs already today in worship and in prayer? Have you come into his throne room today by faith? Have you accessed the throne room of God with your prayers today? You say, Pastor, I believe, I, I feel like when I'm praying that my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. It may be that your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling because you do not have the faith in Jesus to approach the throne room. God, that you somehow believe that your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling rather than believing that you are given, Hebrews tells us, access. Please come with confidence and approach the throne of grace. Psalm 70 verse 5, it says, But I am afflicted and needy. Hasten to me, O God, you are my help and my deliverer, O oh Lord, do not delay. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like someone who believes. Who believes. Hasten to me, O oh God. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh Lord, do not lay. This sounds like a person who believes that they are approaching the throne of God in prayer. Anyone here afflicted? Anyone here needy today? You know, there are some in here that will not admit that they're afflicted and needy, but you are. And I would dare to say if we were to really sit down and begin to analyze the subject of how we're doing, we would all say we are afflicted. Just in case you're thinking, oh, I'm the only one that's here that's afflicted, then my friend, you are in great company because you are sitting next to an afflicted person. They may not realize they're afflicted, but they are miserably afflicted because they are born of Adam. 
They are born again, but they still carry around the flesh that Adam carried around and the sin that Adam has given them, the nature that Adam has given them. The second Adam has done a work on that and bringing us into the Spirit, but we are an afflicted people, and we are to come before God. But I am afflicted and I'm needy. Hasten to me, O oh God. Friend, it ought to be every day of our lives that we come that way, realizing our need for God, realizing our need for grace and mercy and help from God because we need Him. We desperately need God. We cannot do this life on our own. And we are given through Christ access into the very glory and presence of the throne of God. Hasten to me, O oh God. You are my help and my deliverer, O oh Lord. Do not delay. Some of you need to find that place today at this altar. You are my deliverer. You are my redeemer. Cry out to God in your time of need, in your affliction, in your pain, in your hurt, in your trouble, in your despair, in your problem. And ask the God of heaven, the holy God of heaven, the creator of the universe, to meet you, to hasten to me, O oh God. When we talk about the throne of grace, when we talk about the throne of God, we cannot not talk about prayer. Amen, church. John's seeing it. Let's look about the worship around the throne. Number three, the worship around the throne. Pick up with me in verse five. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds of peals of thunder. Have we seen that before? These prophets of God seeing the same things around the throne of God. It's amazing. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We'll explain that once again as we've done before. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And at the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind, the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Now, guys, I just want you to take note as they're saying this. It was like, I'm looking at something I've never seen before, and one of them looks like a lion, okay? But I don't know. There, there's nothing that perfectly describes this creature that I'm looking at, but it's like a lion and like a calf and uh, like a man and like an eagle. Y'all got that? And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within, and day and night they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will bow down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, and our God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. Awesome. Awesome picture of worship going on of heaven. The worship of the angels, the worship of the elders in heaven. You know, the, the four living creatures with the eyes, to me that's the most wild part of this. Eyes in front, eyes in the back, eyes on the outside, eyes within. I would dare to say Hollywood could not even do it, okay? Could not make one of these creatures come alive and help us see what we are seeing or what John is seeing here 
of the four living creatures. Out of the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. The prophets talk about these things. Now, this does give a description of the prelude, even Daniel, a prelude to the to the scrolls, to the books being opened, the peals of thunder, the lightning, the fire that Ezekiel, all of these things are looking at the same prelude to what is about to happen. The seals and the bowls and the trumpets, the judgments of God that are about to be poured out. All of this view of heaven is Jesus saying, I want to show you these things that are about to happen. And John is immersed into heaven in a prelude to the judgment of God. It's awesome. Seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. We've talked about the seven, it talks about the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold character of the Holy Spirit. We've dealt with that prior sermons. A sea of glass, a crystal sea. As we see these visions, as we see what we see as a crystal sea, and men talk about these things as if they're just human in nature and just, hey, I'll see you by the crystal sea, and hey, well, maybe we'll fish some and uh, catch some good fish and you know they think of this in human context of heaven in this way and they don't realize what the Bible is showing us here is the glory and the holiness the perfection holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty listen no other attribute of God is is repeated this way you don't hear that God is love 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 or God is just 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 or God is kind or God is gracious 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 but God is holy 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 it may be the attribute of attributes of our God his holiness it's something that I cannot uh, I'm not in any way perfect in my understanding of the holiness of God but I hope that I understand it better than maybe I once did but it's something that, as a believer, as a Christian, you know that God is holy. And his justice is perfect in declaring the holiness of God. It, it justifies God's punishment upon a wicked world. Because it separates the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man in such a way as this contrast. There's never a thought in my mind in approaching the judgment, in approaching the revelation of the future events to this world of the judgment of the wicked that, you ever, that I would ever think that's too harsh or that is too um, wrathful, that is too much and guys I'm tell you as we get through uh, the judgments that are poured out on the earth we're probably going to feel in our gut how horrific that this time is going to be on the earth on this planet to the point where we will say how could people not repent how could they not turn their life to God and yet they would shake their fist at God and curse God in the midst of these judgments that are poured out on the earth. But holy, holy, holy is, God is holy. God is holier than holy. God is holier than holy, holy. Do you see this? Blasphemers do not understand this holiness of God. They do not understand why a man uses God's name in vain and it causes us to cringe that someone would, with filthy language would speak about God in such a horrific, blasphemous way to think about God's name being trampled on and you know that God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. How blasphemous is blasphemy? How sinful is my sin? How wretched 
is our sin when we compare it with the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And even the men who stand in pulpits today that will not speak and will not defend the supernatural creation of God to me is blasphemous. You remember our creation versus evolution series and I cannot help guys but declare this once again. These preachers who deny the supernatural supernatural account of creation from Moses are blasphemous. For John says that they say around the throne, the elders, worthy are you, O Lord, and our God to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Why? Why do they say that God is worthy to receive glory and honor and power? It is because... It is because the elders say you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. The drastic consequences of our nation, the drastic horrific consequences of our day because of the rejection of Moses' account of creation has destroyed the power in the church and from the church to be salt and light to the world. The four living creatures full of eyes and front and behind. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel talks about these four creatures. Now, guys, please don't, don't, don't be intimidated by this and look at this and goes, I don't know what that means. I don't know what those, all those eyes and the wings and all these things. Guys, look, listen, these are just created beings, okay? That's all they are. They're created beings and they're angels. They're seraphim. They're created for specific purposes. Their, their primary purpose is worship, but we're going to see in Revelation they have other purposes that they will carry out in the judgment, Okay? The judgment of the earth, judgment of the wicked. Ezekiel 1.17 says, whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. Maybe that's why God gave them all of these eyes. They moved in all these different directions and didn't have to turn. Isn't that interesting <laughs> that the Bible says, Ezekiel's talking about these four living, they didn't have to turn to move. We usually have to turn to move. Unless you have a backup camera in your car, you have to turn to move. But they didn't have to turn to move. Why? Because they have eyes everywhere, inside, outside, the front, the back, the sides, the whole deal. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. First creature was like, we're going to talk more about this, guys, and more description. First was like a lion, like a calf. One was like a calf. One has a face of a man. One that's flying, was like a flying eagle. Each one of them have six wings, obviously full of eyes around and within. Day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. I would say... This sermon would probably bore the lost person to death today. Besides the hollering and uh, loudness of this big person they're looking at right now, they'd be totally bored with this whole thing. But if you're a believer, you are totally, totally awestruck right now at how awesome your creator is. How glorious, how majestic. Amen. But I... I cannot save you, dead soul. The Holy Spirit must draw you to the Father and help you see this sight in your soul. Day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy. This, to, this would be an activity or event that a lost person would look at and go, oh man, is that really what's going to be happening in heaven 
wasn't it amazing just a while ago singing about our hope in Christ and listening to the choir, Crossroads Choir, worshiping the Lord just a while ago? I don't know about you guys, I, I've got chill bumps. But people in the world think that is, that is, they don't know our Savior. They don't know of his holiness of God. They don't know what we've been saved from. They give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on his throne, to him who lives forever and ever. Now li listen to this in Ezekiel. <clears throat> this is two prophets, two of God's elect in Scripture, prophetic Scripture, one coming from John, one coming from Ezekiel, trying to describe uh, created creatures, angels. But look, listen to Ezekiel. Just another, just, wow. Behold. Okay, verse 5. Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings. Does that sound familiar? Four living beings. Four creatures. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. We didn't know they had human hands until now. Maybe you did, you've read this. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. <laughs> Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. So Ezekiel's just saying, man, from what I saw, from what I saw, they all had all these faces, okay? And John is saying, one of them had this face, one of them had this face, one of them had this face. But Ezekiel's saying, oh, man, what I saw, whoo, it looked like a cow, looked like an eagle, looked like a man. This must have just blown. These two guys are totally, behold, Wow. Such were their faces, their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching other, another being, two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. And you see the Holy Spirit, that, that seed here too, John says, and Ezekiel says the spirit, whichever way the spirit was about to go, they would go without turning as they went. Isn't this amazing? In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and lightning was flashing from the fire and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. That's why they need so many eyes. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. Pretty awesome. What you see in these angels, these four angels, is just pure worship, adoration. Oh God, help us. Help us turn our complaining into worship. Anybody say amen? Any complainers in here? Just four of us? Bless y'all. Moms, wives, I'll let y'all raise your hand. Do you have any complainers at your house? Amen. Y'all are honest. Thank you, ladies. 
man, God, help us turn our complaining into worship. To enter the throne of God and to petition the Lord to come to his throne of grace, to receive mercy, to receive grace in our time of need. But guys, listen, let us come to him with our worship, with our adoration, with our praise, bringing to him all that we know about him, all of his glorious, glorious glory. 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, will worship him who lives forever and ever, will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. I hope that you'll keep your Bible open. My encouragement to you, to us today is let's worship the Lord the way they are worshiping the Lord in heaven. Amen? We can practice for heaven today. We can cry out to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We can cry out to God, oh Lord, you are to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. Because of your will they existed and were created let us worship the Lord the way they worship the Lord in heaven. No, I'm too proud. I'm too, that's, that's, that's too much. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to, look, friend, let us worship the King. Worship the Lord in all of his glory. Bow down before him. Proclaim his greatness. Proclaim his worthiness. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy is the Lamb of God. Let us pray to him. You do not need anyone else to go to the throne of God for you, even though we will. We will go to the throne of God for you, but you can go to the throne of God, Christian and come into his majesty, into his glory, into his presence in your time of need. You have access through Christ, through his blood. He's the door. And so, Stephen, if you'll come, we're going to worship the Lord. Stephen's going to lead us in worship. And um, I don't know, I don't know how you will respond. That is not my that's not my job. My job is not to try to manipulate a response from people. Hey Amen. I'm okay with this. I'm totally okay with what happens next. I am not trying to create a response. I am here to proclaim the glory and the majesty. I am here to say, behold, the throne of God. That is what I'm here to preach. We are to respond. To enter his gates with thanksgiving in his courts with praise. To approach his throne of grace with confidence. To worship on his holy hill. To worship in his throne room. Amen. And I cannot, I cannot create that. The Holy Spirit hopefully has created an urgency in you to approach because you need him. You need him today. You need his salvation. You, you need his healing. You need his restoration. You need his life. You need his light. You need his hope. You need his joy. You need his peace. Come, enter the throne of God. Petition him. 
Some of you are here today. You need miracles in your life. You need God to do things that only God can do. There's no other way, no other path, no other hope but Christ, no other hope but God. Come, approach his throne of grace with confidence. The other response is to gather with the created angels of heaven. Gather with the saints, the gather, and all the myriads and myriads that attend him, that surround his throne. Gather with them, crossroads. Gather with them to worship the King of glory, to worship him, to call back to him all of his goodness, all of his greatness, all of his gifts, all that he has given to us. Join with the saints. Join with the hosts of heaven to worship God. Father, help us to see the door open and the throne of God. Wow, behold the throne of God. Let us come. Let us pray. Let us seek the Lord for what we need some are need forgiveness of their sins, some of them need salvation, they need a new life transformation, some need sanctification, some need healing some need sin killing power, some need uh, deliverance some need miracles of creative miracles, healing miracles, some just need help some just need hope where to find it, oh God, upon your throne. Bless this time as we move into the throne of God, the throne of grace, through the veil, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with me, church? Would you approach the throne of God? Would you worship Him? Would you seek Him in Jesus' name?